Uh, you know, there's some bills that, like, in this adult life, adulting and that, there's some bills that are just at the bottom of the priority list, like TV license. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. All of that, innit? Haven't had a TV since 2008. Haven't paid for TV license ever. Rob this England in full effect. <laughs> Somewhere on an estate, there is a war. Hunger started it. No one is safe from one in three square mills. Around here, we're hungry and cold. So we cut open the belly of pavement, tuck ourselves in to find warm shelter from our freezing streets. We drink the lights from the street lamps. Learn the alchemy of fear, how to harness it and turn us into more, into Friday night champagne campaign, trading innocence for a full stomach. We don't want your, we don't want your pity. We want your version of this city, the version that eats. Do your dreams take you back to those 63 nights, to the Klim film and Nokia ringtone? Pound coins rubbing against your hollow ribs, sounding like a xylophone, waking up the whole street back when you told your mom that a good reputation won't stop your hunger. So as long as hollow tips cure hollow ribs, you'll marinate these streets like the double yellow lines and you'll eat. Nobody gives food to people with no stomach, with no gut to cut a chunk of meat from the night. Do you still know the taste of night when the whole ends is on its knees and your mother plays to the king of kings? Meanwhile, I just wanna eat like a king before I die. Even if it's just a little bit of sky, I want to rain over something. Nobody forgets kings when they die, that's just the rules. I just want to rain, flood the streets, end the drought, promise you a rainbow, I just want to rain. Tell me an estate doesn't look like a castle. I just want to rain. Yeah, no, for all, pay your bills though, because credit checks and all that. Thanks. It's nice to be here. Um, really nice to be here, actually. The teenagers I work with will rate me forever. Um, just being on a bill with Stormzy, so that is sick. Um, thank you, Apples and Snakes, for having me. Thank you, everyone at Murky Books. Uh, this is sort of a self-explanatory poem, I feel. Um, it's called Thoughts After Surprising Yourself by Thinking About Buying an England Bucket Hat Ahead of This Year's World Cup Semi-Final Match Against Croatia. <laughs> Um, and it's dedicated to anyone who, yeah, was surprised at the fever with which they were picking up an England flag when normally, as Caleb said, rob this England. It goes like this. <clears throat> England. England. England is a word that gets caught in my throat, cannot find a clean way through me. I can't say it without a stumble, so I break it down, carve it up into two pieces so it looks more like how I feel about it. England, 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 land of eating bland food when it's not from another land. La <laughs> land of rain, rain, go away, land of vans, land of white and go home or face arrest vans, land of lions, free they say, free lions for a country too cold for them anyway. <laughs> land of football, home of football, home of my love for football, despite all these thoughts I wish I didn't have when thinking about the word England. Home of buying overpriced sweatshop made England football tat while still flinching at overpriced sweatshop made England flags outside my neighbor's house. Land of contradictions, England. Ing land, ing like in, like slicing off the last G in ing English words like freezing and jarring and amazing. But keep a G in peng, keep a G in ting. No one says pentin to the mandem when describing a girl they like. Keep, keep these Gs to remind you of the Gs you grew up with, not the silver spoon rich kids who say you sound aggressive. Ing like in, like in it, bruv. In it being a word I hear with the same frequency from the boys on my dad's stairwell to the builders by my house to my mum's mates outside church. Why do my Ghana and aunties like to say in it so much? How can the builders outside say in it to me as a substitute for good morning? 
What are the boys on the stairwell actually in, in it, in it? Do they feel stuck as I once did, trapped by ends and a feeling of both belonging to this country, but not quite England? Ing, land, home, 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 homeland. Homeland security style borders around our borders now. Watery borders sharing water with watery Mediterranean graves. England, ing, land, land. My land, my passport, part of this land, my so-called land, a so-called United Kingdom of lands, and my land in this kingdom is England. My home is supposedly England. But why won't England love me? How long is this complicated relationship supposed to last for? My friends are getting bored of me talking about England in our group chat. I hear there are others like me too. He is spending a lot of time with them, but or none of us really feel like we belong to him either. How many years can England string me along and tells me he loves me and how long I'm going to feel that despite those words he wants me, I still don't quite belong? And yet for 90 minutes yesterday, England felt like my land. Isn't that strange? It is a small leather ball being kicked around a rectangle of grass. England, England, my football loving, hopefully one day World Cup winning before I die land. <laughs> England, you are so, so, so ugly to me sometimes. And you are so, so, so ugly to most people almost all of the time. <laughs> Still, a really tiny part of me enjoys how easily I can forget all this and somehow, some way, find both you and this strange, strange game so, so beautiful. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Brandon Turner, but I go by Brandon the Poet, the Machiavellian Mystery, quite a mouthful. Um, I just wanted to thank Apples and Snakes and also uh, Murky Books, because before today, my biggest audience was 50 people. So, um, yeah. <laughs> um, this is a poem about masculinity. <laughs> Sighing, an action taken to reduce the build of pressure found in one's chest through the outtake of air. Yet mine are clogged full of mistakes that I've made. <laughs> and some days are harder than others. Sometimes the pressures of life keep me down like gravity. <sighs> A force too strong to fight whose power surpasses me. Akin to mother nature, so naturally sometimes I don't bother fighting but that just feeds the depravity depression brings. And I have no idea how to face it because I was never taught. So how do I explain to my boys and my family that life is high-key manhandling me when I'm meant to be a man? See, the inactivity feeds it, yet my body refuses to do anything else, so what now? And I understand that masculinity is just toxicity disguised, but who am I if I don't buy into its long history to get me by? Because boys will be boys and men are men and that's what I was raised from. Which is why we, not just I, feel as if we have a right to all things from her body to those clothes, that lifestyle to those crepes, yet we still can't face the reality of our mental health. Instead, we repress emotion in little boxes that we've made for ourselves. <laughs> Substitute therapy for self-medication. And when something goes wrong, we just shrug it off because it gets like that sometimes. Now hear this. Because if I don't hide my feelings away, put a smile on my face and act like everything's okay, then my weakness will be blatant and I'm in no position to face the consequences or the weight of the choices that I've had to make. And I understand somewhere that there is no weakness in accepting weakness, but I will feel weakness all the same because that is the fragile nature of masculinity, you know? Simply a poet, thank you.
Okay, how are you feeling, ladies and gentlemen? You good? Yeah, yeah good. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent, I'm awake. excellent, excellent. <laughs> so I'm going to open with you, Mallory. Oh, okay. Yes, seeing as we, you know, I, w I would say probably of, of, ever, of everyone on this panel, in, in, including Benjamin, probably, you've probably got the longest experience in, in publishing, actually publishing books. What wisdom can you share with us about this and what has given you that kind of secret of longevity? You know, you were around, not to, you know, not to hot you up, but you were around when I was a youngster, you know, when I was in school. Well, um, How have you lasted so long? Well, I've, I've been a published author for 28 years. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think the secret to longevity is um, be true to yourself. And I never forget, there's in one of Quincy Jones's um, LP, showing my age now, but um, there's a song at the beginning called Back on the Block, I think it is, and he says, and there's, I think it's Ice-T says uh, that Quincy Jones told him, um, if you, if you listen to people and let them tell you what to think and what to write, your whole career will be over by tomorrow night. And it's absolutely true. If you, you've got to be true to the, yourself and tell the stories you want to tell, which is not to say you don't take advice. You take advice from anybody and everybody, but, what you, but I think, and, and use it to make your own work better. But if you have a story to tell, don't let anyone tell you that you haven't or they don't want that story. Because there's plenty of people who will say, oh, we don't, that's not your story, this is your story. You should be telling this story, but don't listen to them. And the things that have worked the best for me are the things I've taken risks on. And that's been a real object lesson to me because I've, I've sat down to write things like when I sat down to write Noughts and Crosses, I thought I'm gonna get a real <laughs> kick in for this. But thank you. But I, 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 seriously, I sat down and I thought, this is probably going to sell four copies and I'm going to get a right kick in, but I'm going to do it anyway. And, you know, and, and things like Pick Up Boy, which I had criticisms about where people were, uh, one guy said to me, no child wants to read about, the, about their own mortality. Why are you writing about a boy who's dying? And I, just, I, I thought, this is about you not wanting to read that. But I've never had that criticism from a child or a teenager. So you have to just be true to yourself. That would be my first piece of advice. Can I pick up on two quick bits you said there before we move on? One, you genuinely didn't think Noughts and Crosses was going to be successful. No. I really, I, I'm not just saying that. I seriously didn't because um, I, I knew I wanted to, ha to write something about racism. I wanted to do something that was very stark to say this issue is not black and white. There's so many nuances to it, but I also wanted to turn it on its head and I knew some people would have a problem with that. So the very concept some, I, I thought some people would have a problem with. And I just thought, I, was, thought I'd, I just thought to myself, you know what, I'm gonna write about racism, I'm gonna do it my way and I'm gonna let rip. And it was things like, you know, things that happened to me. It was also very cathartic to me because it's things like the first time I traveled uh, first class on a train and the ticket inspector accused me of stealing the ticket. And that's in the book and that happens to Callum, but that was a true thing that happened to me. Yeah. Or saying to my history teacher, how come you never talk about black scientists and achievers and inventors? And she said, because there aren't any. And I didn't know any better because we'd never been taught about any. And I, was, I had to educate myself in my 20s. I, all my money went to the black bookshop in Islington. And that's when I educated myself. Shout out to New myself. Beacon Books. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so um, you know, so th there were certain things. It was about me kind of thinking, okay, I'm ready to write about this now. I'm going to, but I want to do it my way. But I thought, but I'm going to get a kick in, but I'm, I need to do it. It's one of those things where I thought, I need to do this. Beautiful. And the other point there, do you think then publishers, adults in general, coming back to your second point about not writing about mortality, that we patronize young people, that we talk down to them, that actually we underestimate their intelligence? Oh, God, yes. Oh, God, yes. I think um, anyone who doesn't deal with children and, and, and teens on a regular basis um, does... It seems... It's funny. It's like some people, they, they, they hit 21 or something and they completely forget what it was like to be a teen. Mm -hmm. And it, they think, oh, no, we shouldn't be exposing our teens to this and we shouldn't be talking to... You know, we shouldn't be exposing our teens to that. If a teenager can go through it, then it's a legitimate subject, I think, to write about and to talk about. Yeah. And, you actually, and I think we actually do our, our children and our teens a disservice by not addressing issues. So issues like racism and so forth. I mean, I, I, I recently co-wrote... Um, the, an episode of Doctor Who, the Rosa one. Jeez! And, and, but, but again, it was sort of like, I, I, when we were sitting down to write, I thought, I, I'm gonna, I want to do justice to Rosa's story. So things like as soon as they land in, um, in, in Montgomery, Alabama, and, then, and, and Ryan gets slapped, and I thought, I'm gonna put it in anyway, you know? So it's things like, because I wanted to be true to that time, and, it's, and I think you, we do, we, it's such a disservice to hide the truth 
or to pretend it didn't happen because then you're in danger of repeating things. And I think that's what we're kind of going through at the moment. So for me, it's incredibly important. That's why I love fiction, because it may not be... It may not be real, but it's true. The best fiction, I think, is true, and absolutely. it's you have to, and it's honest. Mm -hmm. And I think, and actually, and teens absolutely get that in a way that sometimes I think adults forget. Mm -hmm. So, Professor Benjamin Zephaniah, yeah. well, I'll go on, sir. <laughs> yo, yo, yo. So, uh, you know, I bumped into you earlier this year. I can't remember if it was Cheltenham or Hay. Hay Festival. Okay, and you were promoting a book. You, you've written an autobiography. My talk life me and through, rhymes. Talk me through that process. You know, how you feel about it and talk, talk, me, talk to me about being Professor Benjamin Zephaniah. Well, before I start, if I can, I just wanted to say that I'm not sure about the maths, but I was first published in 1981. I don't know how many okay. years is that. Right. There you go. Um, so, there you go. And when I started writing, um, what Mallory, uh, Mallory said about um, um, being true to yourself is absolutely true. We differ in that when I started writing, it may be hard for people of a certain age to understand this. For a black person to walk the streets at night, it was difficult. Police stop you, national front stop you. You know, there's all kinds of things going on. So I started to, started to tell my story. I remember I did a poem called This Policeman Keeps On Kicking Me To Death on a television program called Black On Black. Does anybody remember it? And when I did that program, for the first time in Britain, People saw a black man on television talking about an experience that a lot of young black men were going through. In those days, police would just pick you up, beat you up, and then just throw you on the street. And I wrote about it, and I remember the next day, I tried to go shopping in London, and I couldn't. Because so many people, I remember a bus driver stopped the bus in the middle of Piccadilly Circus, got off the bus and said, I've got to touch you, brother, I've got to touch you. <laughs> because they were having similar experiences, you know. So, that's how I started writing. And I think now, a lot of people a lot of people don't have that experience. They have experience of racism, of course, but not the experience of not being able to walk the streets at night, not being able to drive. In my book, The Life and Rhymes, I talk about buying a, I earned a bit of money, right? New Musical Express, give me a bit of money, I feel nice, I go and buy myself a white BMW. Right? I drive it from Labrook Grove <laughs> to East London. I get stopped four times on one journey, four times. And the last time I asked the policeman, I said, I said I've been stopped four times. And he was really honest. He said, we've been told to stop Rastafarians in BMWs. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so you're going to get stopped, you know? So anyway, that's, that's why I started writing. And um, my whole thing is about trying to document my experience and therefore a lot of it was the experience of the larger black community and the white community to a certain extent because I was in the punk raster thing, you know, and some of the white kids were getting it the same way we were getting it. But when it comes to writing the life and rhymes, the, my autobiography, I just felt that I wanted to write something that was personal, political, and something that could also be used as a kind of history, maybe a personal history, but a history all the same that people can look back and, um, and understand what we kind of went through. Because, you know, Linton Kwesi Johnson said it, and I think it's absolutely true. Sometimes we don't realize, but it's no mystery. We are making history. You are going to do something, but no other black woman has done. <laughs> you are going to do the same thing. You know, we all, are, we all are making history. And so I just wanted to document my history. And um, I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back to the second part of the question. But, you know, some of the experiences you're talking about, do you think there's a danger now, you know, those of us, especially in London or Birmingham or Manchester, who are used to a kind of relative degree of multiculturalism, do you think there's a danger of forgetting just what it was like during the 80s? I think there's a real danger. The, we, we need to understand history because we need to know where we come from and all those things. You've heard it from Marcus Garvey, you've heard it from Akala, the, the, the importance of understanding history. But for me, one of the most important things is that we don't make the same mistakes. You know, there's nothing wrong with making a mistake, but when you keep making the same mistakes, that when something is, that's when something is really wrong. And if you look at society generally, 
the general body politic, if you like, of Europe and America, they're not learning from their mistakes. <laughs> you know, and so we're living through really dangerous times. So to understand where we come from and to understand what we are capable of mm -hmm. is really, really important. Mallory uh, alluded to um, black scientists earlier, you know? I mean, if you can understand that, you know, black people were inventors, were innovators, were mathematicians, uh, not just musicians and dancers, although we love that too, mm -hmm. you know, you can understand the great things that we can do for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's the importance of history. Absolutely. And Last part, just before you move on, and even looking at you know this panel, which feels a little bit like you know three generations, not in a, not in a bad way. You know, I grew uh, up, <laughs> no, I grew up reading you two's work in school, right? But I'm pretty sure I'm a bit older than the other three members uh, of the panel too, right? Yeah. So it yeah, feels. I'm the oldest. I'm the oldest, aren't I? I don't know. I don't think so. I think I'm the oldest. I'm he, he's a vegan, so that's he's, <laughs> he's, 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 he's Asian. Oh, oh, how old are you? Tell the world. I'm 56. I'm 60. Oh, okay. Him, oh. I look 60, <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost 61. <laughs> Me and your dad used to ride together, you know yeah, that? Of course I know. Yeah, course, yeah, old yeah, school, yeah. Old school. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I think even, even that sort of, it feels like, you know, the wisdom is being, is being passed on more than maybe we, we sometimes realise. You know, I was, tell, I was talking to some young kids the other day, and I thought I was just telling them sometimes about when I was young and vulnerable and sometimes crazy and I think, and I'll never forget it, at the end they just went, wow, that was a great history lesson. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah, exactly. <laughs> and actually I think it's like, <laughs> I don't know, I mean, once upon a time, people used to come to me and they used to go, boy, I love your poems, man, I love your thing, you know, what are you doing tonight? And now it's like, my parents used to, used to read your poems to me at bed. <laughs> <laughs> Jude, how you doing, good sir? I'm, I'm great. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. So you are, how can I put this? I mean, you're the, you're the author of this book, but I would say the narrator as well, yeah. you know, because the book is obviously a collection of perspectives within the Murky team. Firstly, how did that come about? And secondly, you know, how did that process feel from, from your side? Yeah, well, it came about through like several years of perseverance in my own writing. So I started writing through my degree. I studied philosophy, I graduated, but I didn't feel content. There was no like black philosophers throughout my whole three years of my course. And the closest I got to understanding my identity a bit was um, reading Black Skin, White Mask by Franz Fanon. Mm -hmm. yep, yep. And Shout out to like, Franz Fanon. Yeah. So it was like, when I was doing that in my second year of uni, I was um, doing existentialism and that came up and I was like, why, why don't I do a few essays on this? Because it will help me expose kind of my own identity and how I'm feeling a bit. But yeah, so I started writing through philosophy essays and then I moved on to articles, done a few dialogues. Then I just thought really and truly like creatively, I wanted to be able to express myself, not through just philosophy as it was such an academic space. So I realized if I started to actually identify like how I was feeling my own identity moving forward, maybe I can establish something worth like considering for like a young black British person. So I always had that angle of my writing, and um, then it got to a point when I started to read into history a lot more. And um, funnily enough, there was even this one lecture that um, I attended of yours in, in Brixton. This is like three, four years ago, like with my friend, she's in the audience. Um, so yeah, and then I even asked you a question, like what do you think of this black British experience in contrast to African Americans? And I'm a second generation Ghanaian, so I've grown up, <laughs> Shout out to the Ghanaians in the house. <laughs> I'm mad, this is bare. But yeah, so I grew up influenced a lot by Jamaican culture, but also recognized that a lot of. Shout out to the Jamaicans in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then it's nuts because my dad always encouraged me to read, and I was always quite good at writing in a sense. I used to do lines in school, I was, it was quite bad. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it got to a point where I kind of had like a very distasteful, I used to hate reading and writing, like honestly, because I didn't see myself in it. So I got to a point when I was so like alienated from writing and my dad used to suggest that I read like Shakespeare and stuff like that. But my kind of Shakespeare was like your tune. 
for example, you know what I mean? It's like, and the whole tape, A Little Darker, like that spoke to me. It, all these like young black British examples of people actually creating, um, I used to see shows like um, Dub Plate Drama, for example, and just see- That was ahead of his time, you know? It's, yeah, things like ahead of his time. So I read it in a way of like, oh, how can I apply my own situation to this? And so I've always kind of had that angle and appreciation for black Britishness in general. I just never had a way to put a finger on it. So um, yeah, like I feel like through social media, there's one thing that's really good about it is that we're really interconnected and we can literally learn a stream of ideas in seconds opposed to several years ago when that wasn't a possibility at all. So I tried to feed myself through these channels and many of the people in the audience here have like, supported my work over the years. And I've just been forever grateful for that, but it kind of built up my conception of black Britishness. And then, yeah, so this is like several years ago now, probably like 2013, 2014, Stormzy was, um, obviously doing his thing, like leasing his freestyle videos, like the Wicked Scareman freestyle videos, but I've always, I've always like heard of him or seen his face on, on YouTube videos and stuff like that. But when I started to pick up the interest in what he was actually doing, it felt like, like within his lyrics, within just the way he composed himself, that he realized that what he was doing and what he's a part of was much greater than himself. So it was that kind of selflessness that just made me think like, you know what, I'm gonna support this guy. And I was just like sharing this content and usually I would expect like people from our communities not to give an interest to like writing or something like that. But he would actually read my articles and reply and be like, yeah, sick, keep it up. And it's like, raw, like this guy's clearly blowing gradually. Like why does he care about this like little kind of blog that I'm just writing about my ideas and then yeah, it got to a point where he said, yo, like, I want, want to work with you in the future. Would you be down to do it? And I was like, yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course, fam. <laughs> like, like, who would say no? So, yeah, I just kind of hoped that I would be able to do the job. You know what I mean? I didn't want to let anyone down. So, yeah, after he said that, like, a few years ago, I always had the idea that, yeah, maybe if I keep pushing with my work and I can build on this concept of, like, where we're coming from, then maybe it could just add to this state of the community that's just building. I've, I see a lot of potential in young black British people right now. That's, that's what's kept me energized over the last several years. And then, yeah, the actual process came about, like, the start of this year, he said, um, he sent me a message and said, yo, like, what's your email? I'd like to get into, get it to you, Akua. She's my brand manager and she'll reach out to you. And then it was like April, we linked up. We um, linked up with Penguin spoke about the idea of the book and how they wanted it to be a murky team thing. And for me, this was like really pivotal and, and important because there was no way I was gonna say no, but I wanted to understand what he wanted me to do for him. Mm -hmm. So it was literally always about the team. And so once we put that idea together, what I was thinking is, I'm coming from Crystal Palace, that's in South. He's from like Fort and Heath, which is like 15 minutes away. We're same age as well, and Ghanaians, second generation Ghanaians. So I felt like my perception for, for this book and going into it, there's only a few people, well not a few people, probably a few thousands of people with that perspective coming from situations we're coming from and being able to articulate in the way that we do. So funnily enough, I even went to this one like talk it was a rain dance festival, but this director told me this one thing that's just stuck with me forever. He was like, um, no matter what like, script is written by a writer, it's the actual director like, that would decide the outcome of it. So you can hand someone this information, the director will always be the one that changes the outcome. And with this project, I was essentially a director alongside Penguin. We had um, a lot of creative control and we just played with the ideas, done the interviews, and it was such a, I don't want to belittle the process, but it was very easy for me because I've never been in a situation where I can just work purely within my community about our ideas, about our growth. So it was a thing of like anticipating the mental journey alongside my own that Stormzy has been involved in. And the outcome has just been mad inspiring and, and energizing, like literally every, 
every couple of minutes. I'm probably even getting messages now of people reading a book, saying how proud and inspired they are. And for me personally, it proper hits home because so many people from different walks in life, like I got expelled from school as well when I was 13. So I had a very checkered kind of educational run, but I'm getting people from pupil referral units that are messaging me like, like what the f I'd, yeah, your big. name's on the book, fam. Yeah, and it's big. like, yeah, of course, that, yeah, that's me, bro. Like, I'll get you a copy and stuff like that. But it's oh, like, <laughs> it's like, it's, it's sick to see no, the big. amount of people, like, from different areas. Like, people that don't even care about reading, like, at all, are literally saying, yo, I'm going to pick this up because I know it's important. I know where we're coming from. And for me, that's what it's for. Amazing, amazing. Beautiful. Please, round of applause. So, Chelsea and Ori, this is a double question because you know, we've, got, we've got a tag team here. Um, you know, you're going to release the first non-Stormzy book on Murky Books, right? So first of all, I want you to tell me about, about that book, how it came about, what's contained in it, but also how you managed to write as, as a tag team. Because I feel like if I had to write with someone else, I'd kill them. Um, <laughs> you know, so how do you manage to, pu to pull, off, pull, pull that off? Um, so... The book is basically meant to talk about black girls' experiences at university more generally, but particularly predominantly white universities. So both of us went to Cambridge and we just graduated in the summer. Um, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and it's about basically trying to be um, that big sister to black girls who are going to come after us um, and go through that experience as well. How can we prepare them for the challenges that they will face in that space inevitably, um, whether that's academically, whether that's in terms of their social life, challenges that they're gonna have settling in, um, but also how we can show black girls that we not only survived Cambridge, but thrived in that kind of space, despite the obstacles that were against us. So I think it's about kind of showing people what that experience is, platforming our voices, showing that it's more than just numbers and, and how many black people got into this university this year, um, but showing people what that actually looks like through our experiences, but also through the broader conversation about what it means to be a black girl at university. Yeah. Do, do you think that was the full sum up or have you got anything to add? <laughs> it was good, it was good. Um, but in terms of kind of writing the book, so it was really funny because Mallory actually asked Aura if she's a full-time writer. And we were both like, we wish. <laughs> she has, um, so she's in New York at the moment um, at Columbia Journalism School. And I've just started law just school casually. in London. <laughs> just casually. <laughs> I'm writing a book on the side. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's been just a really kind of therapeutic process where we're just cross editing. Um, there'll be times when moments just pop up and it's like oh do you remember when this happened or do you remember when ha that happened so it's a very kind of natural process um but i think it works well that we were such good friends at university and we also did the did you know each other before university or you met at uni just before just, okay. just before um we met at a careers event before we went to cambridge um but then throughout university we've been best friends really tight so yeah it's been fine. It's been it's been a good process. Yes. And there was no there was no beef during the writing of the book. It was. No, 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 I'm, no. Ge I'm genuinely admiring of that. I would kill someone if I had to co-write with them. It's I think I think also because we like we have worked together before yeah. in terms of running ACS. We know we complement each other really well. Yeah. So like Chelsea calms me down sometimes, <laughs> but then also I'm like Chelsea, you need to speak up. Yeah. Um, and we yeah. kind of have that balance. And because we've divided the bits that we're writing. We're only writing one bit together. Um, we can work on it independently. Um, so it works quite well in terms of we're writing the bits that we feel more qualified to write on. Um, and yeah, we, we work together fine. Yeah, it's pretty and, good. And how did the relationship with Team Murky come about? So, um, Last December, I wrote an article about a, let a letter to my fresher self about surviving university. And the feedback was from a whole bunch of people, not just black girls, was, oh my goodness, I can so relate. That's so me, that's so me. Um, and I think it was just, I don't know, it was kind of surreal to think that that wasn't just my experience, but there were other people who were going through that. Um, and then fast forward, Chelsea and I are on holiday and we just got our results. Um, and Chelsea's sister calls and was like, obviously, congratulations, you guys killed it. Nah, 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 nah. And then she was like, ha ha, you guys should write a book. And we were like, ha ha, lol. 
<laughs> yeah, we should so write a book. Like, we just kind of brushed it kind of away. Um, but then next things, we were having a meeting with Penguin. We're like, okay, right, this, this actually might be real. And we actually have an opportunity to take control of this conversation. Because, um, I mean, a lot of MPs have a lot to say about what it means to be black at Cambridge. But when are we going to talk about, when are we going to own that conversation? Um, and I think it's important. It's important. So, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. We've got about nine minutes left. So mm. what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to throw a few questions. I know it's going to go so quick, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm gonna throw a few questions out and whoever the mood comes to, I'll probably take, what, the first question I'll take from everyone, but the others I'll take, you know, two on each. These are more general questions. Favorite book, you can only pick one book and why? I've said mine. Chimamanda, Purple Hibiscus. <laughs> and why? It's just an amazing book. And I think what Jude was saying as well, just in terms of seeing representation and I've always felt like the books that I've connected with the most are the ones where the characters look like me. So I felt like with that book, and it was written beautifully as well. It was an amazing book. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, so, um, and not just because Mallory's next to me, I told her this <laughs> earlier. Um, but I, I kind of judge books based on the impact that they have on me. And I read the Noughts and Crosses trilogy when I was in year nine, alongside five of my friends, and it changed my whole life. I told Mallory all about it already. Um, but I think just the whole idea of, um, even though my school was really diverse, beginning to conceptualize ideas of race, racism in my head that I hadn't necessarily been so exposed to um, was just so important and so powerful for me. Um, because it was difficult to read, it was difficult to try and think about the world that way round. Um, and it just really, really impacted me. So yeah, the Norton Crosses trilogy just changed it. Clearly you weren't, you weren't on your own from the reception yeah. <laughs> Mallory got when she walked on stage. Mallory, you can only pick one. You know what, I'm not going to. I, I, <laughs> People I, always do that. I'm not going to. I cannot pick a favorite book. Okay, fair enough. So there's just too many that I love and that have absolutely spoken to me, have changed my life, have changed my thinking, more importantly, I think, and changed my way of viewing the world. But I, uh, there's just been a number. recommends then. <sighs> You're going to recommend us a book. Recommend. It's, we're not committing you to it being your favorite. <laughs> okay. Because I know what, that's emotional. A, a book that would be in my top 50 that I recommend. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think V for Vendetta. Okay. And V for Vendetta. The graphic novel. Uh, gra the graphic okay. novel. And, and like Alan Moore, you know. And I love Alan Moore. I love graphic novels. Me too. I was told at school never to read them. And I remember reading V for Vendetta and just being thinking, wow. Yeah. And as soon right. as I finished it, I took a breath and I started reading it again. And that whole thing about um, standing up to authority figures mm -hmm. and, and, and not being afraid to claim our space. And just because they're in authority doesn't mean they, could, they rule over us. They rule by, they're supposed to rule by consent. Mm -hmm. And it had so many really interesting themes and ideas in that that it just blew me away. So I read that, it was, I was in my late teens, I think it was, and I remember that having a real, real impact on me. Beautiful. But that's just in my top 50. <laughs> Um, I would find it difficult to say my favorite one, so I'm going to say the book that really changed my life. <clears throat> and I'm sorry, it's a bit predictable, but it's The Philosophies and Opinions of Marcus Garvey. Jeez. Um, <clears throat> I don't well, think that's predictable. Well, you know. For a raster man, it's predictable, <laughs> perhaps. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <fair enough. laughs> I really can't stand Bob Marley. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Go on, no. um, but I've got to tell you, I mean, I was telling Mallory earlier, when I was five years old, I went to a, uh, a primary school, me and my twin sister. And on the first day at school, to celebrate the arrival of me and my twin sister, they told all the children the next day to bring in their favorite gollywog. You know, that's how they celebrated our arrival. A few days later, I was walking down the road, and a guy riding a bicycle had a brick. And as he drove road past me, he slapped me on the back of the head with the brick and said, go home, you black bastard. And I remember I went home and I said to my mother, well, I've come home. I was going home anyway. <laughs> I couldn't understand. And, and uh, I'm black. And, and I kept saying to her, mum, what's a bastard? And my mother doesn't use bad language. And she said, she wouldn't tell me what a bastard was. And I thought the bastard was the bad thing, you know. But then, after all those experiences, I started to feel inferior. Because at this time, we lived in a white area. And... I found this book, The Philosophies and Opinions of Marcus Garvey. I couldn't read properly. And I've just recently reread it, and I don't agree with everything, you know. But 
the amount of pride it gave me. Mm-hmm. You know, it made me walk down the streets with my head kind of high. Mm-hmm. And when I came to London, I used to borrow it from a library. And one day I went in to borrow it again in Halsden. And um, it wasn't there. And they said they've taken it off the shelf. And it was in like a, it was on a trolley. They were putting it around the back and they were taking it off the shelf. So I'm going to tell you, I've, I've said this before and it's true. I stole it. <laughs> I, I thiefed it. <laughs> and I was, I was telling this story on television not so long ago. And the library wrote to me. <laughs> And I've got, it, I've got it at home now, and they've stamped it, and they've given it to me. You know? so, I think books are legitimate items to steal. I'm just, I'm just putting it out there. I'm being honest, you know? If someone steals my book, it's okay. That's a beautiful story, though. Man. Dude. Yeah, um, it's going to be a weird one. I'm not sure if anyone's heard of it, but The Stranger by Albert Camus. Okay, yes, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, The Stranger by Albert Camus. Someone studied philosophy. Yeah. It's mad, but I read that after my degree, after, um, actually, but um, I probably like the book because the way he articulates, it starts by um, him saying, my man's died today, which means my mum's died today. And so immediately, you're already thinking of what's his mental process. And as the dialogue literally builds, you're looking directly into like a humane kind of framework and mindset. and everything that he amounts to is literally kind of the way I perceive life in an existential kind of, kind of sense. So I felt like it related, it related to me a lot, but it also kind of voices a deep kind of human crisis that I feel like everyone actually experiences. And I feel to articulate that, you have to be like a really top-notch writer. And yeah, Camus just does it for me. Beautiful, beautiful. More general, why do you guys think that imprints, ventures like Murky Books are so important? I'm going to go to you first, Chelsea. I would say representation. Um, a big thing about Cambridge, especially, I didn't want to apply. That was like not my goal. I wanted to stay in London. Um, it, that was mainly because I didn't see anyone who looked like me. So I always saw Oxbridge more generally as if you want to go into government, politics, um, essentially white men, and I was the complete opposite. So I think with something like Murky Books, you've got representation in terms of the writers, the actual process, the people behind the imprint, which I think is so important, and it just becomes a very accessible process to get the future generation to read different types of perspectives and different types of books. Because there's more than just one perspective. Like all of us sitting here, we all have a completely different perspective. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the main main thing. Mm -hmm. What do you think about what what Jude Jude was saying this to everyone in general, you know, when you were saying you didn't expect to see people like you represented in stories and people like you read in particular type of books. How important do you think it is, particularly for you know, such a popular cultural figure, not just a black cultural figure, mm. but you know, a, 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 a pop star with credibility to, to make you know, reading cool, essentially? Yeah, I think like, going through the whole process, I think is such a... Because I had to be tight-lipped while I was making the book, and like, the Stormzy Scholarship um, came out, and obviously it's with Cambridge. Um, I had to literally watch all that happen without saying that I'm actually writing a project. So what I witness is like there's an unfortunate kind of juxtaposition from where he's standing because in terms of investing in something other than what is popular within our communities or what the mainstay of society witnesses is popular for us, like it's very alienating. Like people can't actually understand the worth of a scholarship or the worth of murky books and what it could do to impact the world. Like just actually knowing that that Stormzy has an imprint um, with Penguin. Um, I always think like, what would I be doing if I was four years old? And I've been seeing four year olds with like iPhone X's. I, d- I have an iPhone 8, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but these lot are literally waking up every day and seeing just pure blackness, black Britishness. I used to wake up every day and watch Fresh Prince in Bel-Air, of Bel-Air, whatever. Like, you know what I mean? And it just like built up my perception of blackness a lot through African, American, an African-American lens, but it's like what was going on here needed to be interconnected. And I feel like 
through stuff like murky books, it just shows that on the other side of what we might popularize is this mm -hmm. thing that's happening. I also think that there's a kind of stereotype of hip hop and grime artists that, you know, they're not intelligent, they're not really interested in education. Mm -hmm. You know, all they can do is rap, and, and especially when it comes to money, they just, you know, it's just for themselves. And to see Storms, they actually really genuinely, not tokenistically, giving back to the community mm -hmm. and giving people a voice is really, really important, you know. Um, with the little time we have left, I just want to say, for, for me, the most important thing is, I had a tweet from some children today to school talking about one of my books that they've read, and I automatically tweet back and say, right, now I want to read your books. Absolutely. If we don't write our story, somebody will write it for us. Mm -hmm. And they'll get it wrong. Beautiful. And they'll get it wrong. <laughs> and then we'll complain. Mm -hmm. So we've got to write our own stories, and that's the importance of Murky Books. So this is our last question. Everyone's got less than 10 seconds. Wow. Okay. Yeah? One tip for all the budding writers out there. My tip is don't give up. Um, just start. I feel like the hardest bit is actually just starting the writing. So I would say just start. Go for it. Foresight. I was crap at writing like six years ago, but now this. Don't believe the hype. Don't, re don't just write what's fashionable. Write what's you and keep having sex. It's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> zoop, zoop, zoop. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for Chelsea Kwachi, Ori Agumbi, Mallory Blackman, Benjamin Zephaniah, and Drew Lawson. Please make some noise, ladies and gentlemen. Take a bow, please, ladies and gentlemen. Big up. Don't go nowhere. We'll be back in just a moment with the man himself, Big Mike. Bless up, bless up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for Big Mike, aka Stormzy. Fam. Before we get into it, a tiny bit of housekeeping. Your tickets all included a copy of the book. Many of you have not collected your copy of the book. Don't leave it sat outside. Make sure on your way out you collect a copy of the book, please. So, sir, how you doing? What's happening? Beautiful. So my first question. One, why publishing? And two, why a team book? Why, why not just focus on your individual story? Why, why that team story that you've chosen to tell? Um, firstly, publishing because Really, I always say it was because of Jude. He gave me the initial idea of like, oh, flipping that. I was, I was seeing him write so much on Twitter and it dawned on me that I was like, I think, that was like a lot of artists always create, I said it before, a lot of artists create um, record labels. We, we do have a record label, but mm -hmm. I said, yo, like, would we be able to publish writers? And I, I wanted to do it in a, in a, in a very separate way in, in, the, in the sense of just having a platform where it, 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 it's self-sufficient. Like away from Stormzy and everything I do, like there's this platform where if you're an incredible writer, you can go there and get published like in whatever shape, way, shape or form. That was kind of like the initial idea. And the second question was? The second question uh, was, why about the team? About the team. The re so at first I was really, I, 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 if I'm being honest, I didn't want to do a book. Like I, 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 I wanted to have, murky books as a publishing company and then publish other people's books. I didn't want to have one personally because I feel I'm, I'm only 25. I feel like it's very, very, very early in my career. I always say I'm probably not even a quarter of the way in, in terms of where I want to be in my career. I wouldn't even say 25%. So I was thinking having a book about Stormzy is a bit like, what the f I ain't done much. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I think a few people might disagree. Yeah, no, 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 of course. And, 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 and of course, I'm, I'm very grateful for everything. 100%. But it's like, I was thinking, I, 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 like I, I'm, I'm one album deep, I'm an no, artist with one album. I said, I'm not sure about a whole book, but when, when Penguin and, and the team said, yo, like, we'll make this the murky story, I was like, yeah, that's, that, that, that's a story that I think needs to be told right now in terms of like, how we came together and assembled and created this thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. And introduce us to you know, some of the members of the murky team. Who are they? Oh, the murky team. And what do they do? The murky team, ah, oh, gang. Where? AK, I, oh, I don't want to forget anyone. AK, Big Cub, Toby, of course. Um, Rachel, of course. 
Flips, of course. Uh, Trev, Tiny, Calum, of course. Uh, Aisha, of course. Rhymes, of course. I said flips, didn't I? I said you flips. You did say flips, yeah. Uh, I think that's everyone. Uh, I mean, if everyone. it ain't, if it ain't, I'm in trouble. I love you though, differently, my team. Yeah, nah. Uh, what, what do they do, you know? What are some of the key roles in, in the murky team? Do you uh, have to describe everything. Do you, know what, do you know what their key roles are, if I'm being dead honest? Keeping this mad brain of mine, like, protected yeah. and, and sheltered and allow, they allow me to be, they, they, they allowed me to be a creative spirit. And mm -hmm. that's, that's, because for a long time, it, it, at the beginning of my journey, I feel like I've, I've always been juggling, I wouldn't say music, I, I, I say I've always been juggling my creativity and that, that muscle in me, that, that, mm -hmm. that whole side of me, my creativity. I've always been juggling that with like businessman and marketer and all these other things. And what they've allowed me to do is they've allowed me to just be the creative, as much as I, I always have the urge to like be the businessman and the other thing and the, and the programmer and all of this, but they just allow me to be this person who can live, I can wake up and I can have ideas, I can say, I wanna do this, I wanna do that, I wanna do this, and they just, they allow me to exist. A lot of the time, they, I, I didn't even know, they've been having team meetings without me and that. Like, and, I swear, and, I, and I don't even know, like, I'm, I'm, the other day I had a meeting with Twin, not even the other day, probably like a couple months ago, I had a meeting with Twin and I'm talking to Twin and I'm just seeing the team walk past, I think, oh, is that Aisha, what the fuck? I think, and I see Toby walk past, I'm thinking, right, but they're having a meeting about, some Stormzy stuff that I don't even know that's going on, so it's a beautiful thing, man. They, they help you to not be bothered. 100%, they just, they just allow me to be my, my true, true creative self, like in the, in, the, in the purest sense of it, where I can wake up and I say, yo, I wanna do this, I wanna do that, and, and I know it's gonna be patterned, I know, it's gonna, I know I'm gonna be protected, I know everything's gonna be in place, yeah. But like, Okay, so for some of the you know, aspiring artists out there, they might not know what a tour manager does. Yeah. So for example, one of the relationships I picked up reading the book was your relationship with Trevor. Yeah. Where when you started, you had ideas, but maybe you didn't know what he could bring production-wise. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. What, can you explain like, that technically what some people bring to the table, like how they add value to what creatively is already in your head? Yeah, I think, I think, you, I think you, always, you should always feel someone's value. I think value, especially in creative industries and especially in music, value is, is tangible. Like I feel like it as in, I can, I can literally show you the value of each of my team members as in, yo, this is, this is myself Stormzy without that and this is Stormzy with like Aisha, for example. Like, and that you, the value is tangible and you would always, you would always feel, okay, that's, that person or that, that somebody has elevated this. So with, with Trevor and, my, and touring, I didn't even, I, had, I, thought, I thought a stage show was you just grab the mic and play, be press, yeah, you just, I didn't even know about PA tracks or anything. I just used to play my songs and I'll just spit and keep it moving. And I, I didn't even know there was anything there to develop. Do you know what I mean? Until Trev slowly ushered me in and said, okay, we're gonna add this to your life and we can add this if you would like to. And then the conversations grew, but I think, I think that's, that's the best people will always, you, you might, with the best people, you might not even notice what's going on. Do you know what I mean? When you look back, it will be very evident that, oh, flip a neck, yeah, Trev, you did my live games through, like, my live games through the roof now, like we got it, we finally got it to a place now, but at the time, it was just a slow process of being ushered in and me, me being able to have these ideas. So as I said before about having this team that protect me, they, it, to be fair, it is just this whole, if I say, ah, oh, yo, like, can man get a choir? I know that like, th that's possible. My team are gonna, we're gonna think about it and it's gonna happen, do you know what I mean? So it's about having that infrastructure where anything can happen, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? Beautiful. Yeah. One of the <clears throat> relationships that comes through a lot in your music and in the book, two relationships really, your mum mm -hmm. and your faith. Yeah. Would you say they are the two most important relationships in your life? Oh, my missus as well, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of but course. Most definitely my yeah, missus, yeah, yeah 100%. So I didn't mean it in a sort of higher level. <laughs> yeah, no, no, sense. of course, so of saying, course, of you know. course. All very important for different reasons. I ain't course. trying to stir no divorce out here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so my missus, uh, my mum and my faith in God, yeah, definitely. And to be fair, with, with uh, my faith in God, that's, that's come from my mum. As in, like, I've seen my mum have faith in God 
and that's what instilled my faith in God. Because to be fair, I think I'm 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 sure there's many people here who would relate to like being getting taken to church like as a kid mm -hmm. or like getting getting introduced to God as a child and it starts not that it starts to it, it almost becomes routine like where I go to church like and I, I might not always feel like that spiritual connection to God but I go to church I sing the songs I know I know what's what I'm I'm a Christian do you know what I mean but my my faith my faith in God's been something that I could that that wasn't it wasn't it doesn't come from that. It doesn't come from that routine of going to church. I think that's one thing that's come from actually seeing my mum go to church and my mum pray all the time and my mum be this woman of God and all she had was faith. And I'm thinking, and it's so, it, do you know what? This is why I love my mum because at the time, faith in God can look like a very crazy thing. Do you know what I mean? Like, it was, when you, you know what I mean? Especially when there's nothing in the house. You know what I mean? You got no money and you're hearing about the faith in God and it's like, yo, like, can't see, you know what I mean? Like I literally, I, I, quite, like, I don't know where you're getting like, and my mum's, all, all the time my mum's so driven, just comes from, comes home from work. At the time I didn't even notice how hard she was working, but she'd come home from work, have like a corned beef sandwich, back out the roads, all the time. And it's always had this faith, always smiling, always had this drive. So I think that's like my direct link to, to God, you know, as in seeing like what God's done for my mum and that, that faith there. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. So let's, let's go back earlier. Talk to me just a little bit about growing up in South London. What were some of your key experiences? What was that like? That's something that very much comes through again in the book. You talk about South specifically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Growing up in South just, it's so mad. Do you know what, it's just, now nah, it's like, growing up in South is, it's very special. I think growing up anywhere in London is very special because we, we as Londoners, I'm guessing we're all Londoners here, we feel like London is like the world. Like we, feel, we feel like there's, like, like, I'm not going to swear, but you know, like, forget the rest, like London's, the, the, what, what, what's England? Like, it's London, isn't it? Like, do you know what I mean? That's, that's how we all feel as Londoners. That's how we all feel. About. It's like its own country. Yeah, so growing up in this bubble where we have our own language, we have our own way of doing things, we have our own attitudes, our, our own traditions and everything. And then coming out into the big wide world and noticing, oh, rah. Oh, there's a world. It's not just that. Oh, I thought South London. I thought literally. I thought from Brixton. Do you know? Does anyone know about the 109? Does anyone catch the 109? There we go. So you see where the 109 starts and it finishes. That was the world. That was the whole world. Like I didn't know. That was the whole world. I didn't know nothing outside of that. Outside of that. So coming out of that and into this big wide world and having all this South London in me was so, it was a very big revelation of like, knowing, knowing, knowing my strength, knowing like what, what this place has, has, has given me. It's given me this strength and it's given me this character, but it's also given me these weaknesses and these disadvantages as well. So it was about realizing all of those and learning how to use them to my advantage. And then also knowing that sometimes that might be my, my downfall. So South London, it, it gets ingrained into you to the point where now I'm someone I'm always, I, I always try anyway. I always try to be on like a journey of like becoming a man and growing and that, and that, that South, you can't, you can't grow out of the South London. Like <laughs> when a man, when a man cuts you up on this, you know, on your drive and then he, <laughs> and he cuts you up and it's like, yo, like I'm a grown man, but bro, that's, that's winding me up, you know what I mean? So you can't really grow yeah. all parts of the South London out of you, but mm -hmm. we'll get there someday. <laughs> What's that? South What's that? Norwood, apparently. South Norwood, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. So I'm, I'm not quite, South Norwood's like oh, over there, but, <laughs> but it's cool. We like South Norwood, now South Norwood's cool. South, I've got bridges from South Norwood. I like South Norwood, that's, my, that's, well, you that's know, cool. You, in a, in a way, you know, something that resonated with me, which is actually very similar about, about both of us in terms of contradictions also. Yeah. You know, we, we both grew up in a house full of women. We both got the best exam grades in our, in our year yeah. or in our school, whatever it was. Yet both still got caught up in, for want of a better word, road life at a certain yeah, yeah, period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do you think that, that happens, even to someone as clever as you are? Um, I think it's... I think it's, it's what you know. I think as much as... Be, being, being clever in, in an environment like that, 
as we know, like we're here today and thank God for that. But as we know, there's, there's, I know a man from the ends that were more yeah, smarter than me, 100%. just as smart as me. But it's, it's not always that academic tool might not always be your best weapon in, 100%. in, in, in the kind of terrain we're fighting on. So I, I understand how it gets like that. But for us, I, I'm, I feel like I always say, I always say in terms of like navigating your way out it, I always give it to God because it is it is that whole thing of knowing it's not the fact that man's some like anomaly or like I'm this like kind of oh yeah like I'm this special case it is it is luckily the stars aligned we had enough faith in God and it, all these mad things move but yeah it is, it is a tricky one definitely mm -hmm. definitely coming to music then what what would you say first attracted you to MC in um probably the do you, if I'm being honest, I think the, the, my ability to impress as a spitter, mm -hmm. that was like, as in, I'm not too sure like when I first wrote my lyrics. To be fair, I do rem remember writing a few lyrics and um, showing them to my sister at the time. And I remember my sister always used to go on about my flow. You say my flow, but yo, I got flow now, sis, where you? Oh, she was <laughs> criticizing your flow. Yeah? No, 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 I didn't have flow, my flow was nuts. But so she was right, she was right. But no, she was right, my flow. But so I remember she was just telling me my flow and I remember writing some lyrics now. But in terms of like the first thing that proper attracted me to music and, and I wouldn't even say music if I'm being dead. The reason why I, I won't say, I'll say MCing. And this isn't to say MCing is not music because of course it is, but in terms of I think I was very specific on the art of MC and to the point where a lot of the time there might not have been an instrumental, so it was very MC specific. And it was my ability to impress, like I knew I was good at it. Mm -hmm. Like I knew, like I would hear everyone spit and I'll, I'll write my lyric and I say, okay, I think I'm really good at this. Like I think I'm, <laughs> look at me, I think I'm really good at this, isn't it? <laughs> so yeah, like I, that's, that's where it first come from. And then spit, um, spitting the bar to my sister and, and her saying, yeah, that's cold or no, nah, that's, do you know what I mean? So, so she was sort of your first A&R a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was my first A&R to be honest, yeah, yeah. And then talk to us a little bit about the early projects. 168, Dreamers Disease. What, what was the feeling, what was the energy like in, in those projects? What drove you to do them? You know, you were working, we'll come to the day you quit your job in, yeah, in yeah, a minute, yeah. but you know, what was the feeling and the intent behind those early projects? Um, so the 168 project, the literal, the whole energy and the whole intent of that project. And at the time I thought I was a genius. I thought, oh, I, I thought <laughs> Storms, yeah, yo, yo, you, you got this one, mate. Like, you see, I was like, yeah, boy, but, but I, was on, um, I was doing my apprenticeship and, um, that was that I was I was living in Lemon Spa at the time. I, I was, oh what what? <laughs> what? You brought the locals <laughs> with you, fam? <laughs> that is so random. Who's from Lemon Spa? <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> that is so, no Lemon Spa is like the most random place in the world, like. As in, no one's been there or about cool, big up, big up. Um, yeah, Shout big out up. to the Lemon and Spark Crew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's act, it was actually voted the most nicest place to live in Britain. Yeah. Fair enough. There's some facts for you, yeah. So, your, your projects. Yeah, my projects. So, back to the project, yeah. So, I was living in Lemon and Spa and um, I was doing my apprenticeship. And, but we, uh, for my apprenticeship, we had to go to college. I was in college for 10 months. and. So I was, I was living with 17 other kids and then in my digs, in my specific digs, there was five of us. And only one of the kids, my brother Jack from, he's from, he's from Scotland, a place called Gurek in Scotland. And he was the only person on the course who knew I was an MC. So like, I'm, like I'm, I was literally like flipping Batman, like engineer by day and like flipping <laughs> MC by night kind of thing. But so I'm off the ends like, like way over there and I'm trying to, trying to do this um, apprenticeship, but I'm still like proper passionate about my writing and getting music out there. And I was, I was kind of finding my feet saying, yo, like I want to do this MCing thing kind of half-heartedly. And then I was like, yo, I, I want to drop a project, but I was doing an apprenticeship and then we had half term. So we had one week of half term. And I was like, oh shit, do a mixtape in one week, yeah? <laughs> I was like, do a mixtape in one week. And then, oh wow, how many hours are in a week? 168, oh my days, 168, the mixtape, right? Like, you know what I mean? I was like, this is genius, like, this is genius, like. But, and even at the time, like, so even this was, this was like kind of me exercising that kind of marketing muscle in my head of like, 
I was proper, I was like, like that, wow, 168, the mixtape recorded in seven days, like all of this, like, but I was, I was moving like, yo, I'm, I'm so G'd up, like, yo, I made a mixtape in seven days, like, this is what I'm doing, but it was actually just because, like, yo, I had to get back to <laughs> Lemon and Spa, like, real quick, so that, that was the energy behind 168, it was just like me saying, I want to get a project out there, what's, what's the most clever and time efficient and... Yeah, most, what's the most efficient way to do this? And then with Dreamers Disease, that's, that's, that was, I think, I think in terms of like the names of them, it probably ties in very well because Dreamers Disease was literally that, I was getting to that stage of, I was, I was dreaming so much about this uh, dream of becoming a musician and, and I, I, I was proper, proper going through the motions of like, yeah, like I really want to do this, I really want to quit my job and, and I, it started to feel like, like it was crippling me in a, in a sense. And there's a song, there's a song that I heard um, in, in Lemon and Swire, by the way. There was a song I was driving and uh, I, I couldn't even tell you, but it's, uh, it goes, oh, oh, we got the dreamer's disease. And I heard that lyric and I was like, I was like, what a beautiful way to put, I was like, well, it's such an oxy, like dreamer's disease. It's a beautiful, being a dreamer's a beautiful thing. Like, how's that a disease? And I, but then I was like, wow, I understand that so much. Like this, this, this thing of having an ambition so big, so larger than yourself, that is, is ridiculous. Like, as in, you can't even fathom it. But you, you, that's that's all. That's all that embodies you right now. So it, I, I fully felt it on a deeper one where I was like, yo, like I feel like. I got this dream and it's crippling me, but it's so beautiful and, and I had to get it all out. So that's the energy behind them. Yeah. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. So I want to take you through a, a few of, feel free to give a round of applause, let's come. <laughs> I kind of want to take, well, not you, but really these guys, but I want you to expand you know, on a few of the key points that come out in the book and in, and in your career. And the first one, which you've already touched on, that feeling of the day you quit your job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I did, do you know what, I, I, feel like I've, I feel like I quit before I quit and I feel like I've had different moments of quitting because I quit, I, I came out of college and that kind of felt like, oh, like this is, this is the end of it all and then I went on my apprenticeship and I didn't, I don't remember like there being a day of me quitting or, or I think it was a kind of gradual thing like and I, I, I remember I, I, I had a lot of, um, I was spending a lot of time at, at Represent Radio um, around them times and I can't remember what it was but I think I had a show or something that was clashing with like my work so like it was always like this kind of battle and then when I left work it was a weird thing because I didn't I didn't tell anyone apart from my sister so I was living at home and I just moved back from the apprenticeship and my mum I know my mum was thinking yo like what are you doing you're not working so I'm just chilling at home but so, so she's thinking you was just working every day, like put on a suit and now you're not. But there was never a conversation about me quitting, do you know what I mean? So it was always this kind of, I never felt like I'd done the whole like, oh, I'm quitting today and handed in my resignation. It was this kind of slow process, but I was always ready for it. It was, a, I, 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 I was already gone. Like my head wasn't, my head was already in music and like my body was kind of just floating in there, just kind of munging around. But yeah, that, 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 that's kind of how it, slowly eased into it. Yeah. The, the shisha spot meeting where you, where you planned the murky world takeover. Yeah, do you know, it's, that in the book it sounds so, so we had, yeah, if anyone's read the book, there's, there's a there's speak of a, um, of a, we had a meeting, me, Toby, and, and a few other people had a meeting in the shisha spot about the future of murky. But it is so, it is epic, it is epic, because I look at it and I say, bro, that is incredible, but, if you, the shisha spot was so scatty that like, that, <laughs> like looking back, I'm thinking, right, like that was the beginning of it all, but I don't even think it's there anymore. Like, I don't even think it's there, but we all went to this spot and back then, that's why even in the book, I, I was very specific with my words. I said, I said, um, I, I didn't ever want to um, uh, make it seem like whoever was in the room at that meeting didn't like, un, like, oh yeah, they, they didn't believe. Do you know, like, they, there's always that kind of narrative. Rappers love to do it. Rappers love it. They, you know, the, uh, oh, you didn't believe in me. Mm -hmm. They are, oh, they love it. They, oh, the teachers didn't, they, all of that. They love it. They love it. And some, you know, they, it's cause sometimes the teachers did believe in them and they're just chatting rubbish for the bar. <laughs> Trust me, sometimes it goes like that. But I, I was very specific in the book. I was like, I don't ever want it to look like, oh, like, 
yeah, we had this meeting and like no one could, no one understood like what we was doing because hundred percent at that time, I I wouldn't ex I wouldn't I wouldn't expect any sane human being to understand what we was doing. As in, like, I could, I would if I was listening, if I was if I wasn't myself and I was listening to some guy called Stormzy and his manager Toby who both don't even look the part right now or whatever and they're telling me about this murky dream and you lot ain't even got a 20 pound between you, get out of here, like, do you know what I mean? I would have thought whatever, like, what are you talking about? Like, and back then we, we had the same ambition. So whatever we say now, we're talking about, yeah, one day murky's gonna be a billion pound enterprise. One day murky's gonna be um, ingrained in culture. One day murky's gonna be this self-sufficient engine that, that allows communities to thrive and so all these beautiful things and get proper like, Jeez. and, and we, we zoop, zoop, zoop. I swear to you, we had, we had all these, we had all these visions from early, like, when, like our, the, way, the way me and Toby speak hasn't changed, like as in the, the same ambitions and the same kind of, the big dreams we have were, were the same back then. So anyone who was, when we had that Shisha meeting, 100% like nothing was gonna come of it because we're just talking pipe dreams, like literally like, so we had this meeting and I remember, we said, uh, yeah, like, you're gonna be this person and you're gonna be that person and you're gonna be that person. And from that meeting, I'm, I'm sure there was probably about seven and eight of us in it. I'm sure that, I, I'm sure I think it's only me, Toby. I can't remember, was Tiny in the meeting? Tiny might have been in the meeting and Flips might have been in the meeting, but I can't remember. But there wasn't many people on the murky team from that meeting, so it kind of just goes to show. But that is where it all started, like, if I'm being honest, and this scatty shisha shop. On Norbury High Road. Mm -hmm. Not the most beautiful start, but yeah, we got there. And from there to the day you find out, in fact, you, you may remember where you were, you may not. The day you find out Gang Signs and Prayer has gone to number one. Oh, uh, yeah, that I remember. Journey. That. Yeah, yeah, where yeah, where yeah. were you, if you remember? And, I, was, and... I was at home. I was, um, I, was at, I, was, I was in bed, and then, yeah, and it's not epic at all, innit? This is what I mean. <laughs> it's not what I mean. It, but I was in bed, and... Uh, Kenneth as well, a big up Kenneth as well, my brother. He, he's, he's, been a, he's been a big part of the murky journey as well. I don't think he's mentioned in the book, but he's been a part, he couldn't, he couldn't be here right now. But um, Kenneth, I, he's not passed either. I definitely said that like he's part, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like he can't be here right now. He, no, he's, he's, Kenneth's well, he's his best. Um, but yeah, no, he's just not here. But, um, Shout out to Kenneth. Um, yeah, but Kenneth was in my front room. And I remember I just, I was in my boxes and I just went in there and I was like, yo, we done it. But it was, that was, that was hundred percent my, my number one moment in music. Like my, my most, like the most heartfelt, the most emotional moment. Yeah, that was beautiful, definitely. And speaking of being heartfelt, you know, the album deals with a lot of different themes and you've been, you've dealt with a lot of different themes. We read about even in the book during the process of making the album, you battling with depression and things of that nature. What made you want to open up about you know, let's face it, something that's not really in rap, especially. You know, to, to be vulnerable, basically, and say, you know, I go, I, go, I go through bouts where I'm not feeling great. That's not the most rapper thing to, to yeah, put out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you know what it is? I think I, 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 I always say I get this from Twin. Twin's my a and and Twin always, always emphasizes about uh, music and the truth in music. Like, and it's so mad because a lot of, uh, maybe, maybe the fact that I am a musician is, is it's, that's how I look at it, but I feel like, look at, sometimes uh, when, you, when you're out of music and you look at it, you always think truth and music are just, like you, um, you hear a song and it's true, or like that you just, you, you don't ever question it, but as a musician on the other side, it's like, that's paramount, like in terms of like, what is there truth in what I'm saying? So I think I just really understood that for music to truly be great, there has to be truth. So I can't, there's no way I can do an album even down to even down to me, so me talking about depression and all, and, and all of that is one thing. But even me having an album and talking about my faith in God, me talking about my mum and all of these other things, and uh, me talking about my relationships, I was like, that's my truth. Like if I leave anything out, it's not going to be my truth. Like if I do a whole album about this and that, and I don't talk about my faith in God, that's not my truth because at night I pray. So I'm hiding. Do you know what I mean? I'm hiding one bit. So I was like this needs to be my truth. As much as I'm gonna tell you, yo, I'm the best MC in the world, and I'm gonna tell you, yo, I love my girl, and I'm gonna tell you, yeah, I love God. I was like, I gotta tell you, 
Yo, it's, bro, it's mad for me sometimes. Sometimes I, do you know what I mean? I go through whatever. So I, I, at the time I didn't, I've never seen it as like me doing like some kind of, I didn't even see it as a brave move. I, don't, I, I still don't really see it as like, oh yeah, I was being brave. I just thought, yo, like, this is my truth. If I'm trying to be a true artist and I owe it to myself and to my music to make sure this is truth, it has to be truth. And that, that's hopefully, that's the merit I'm judged on. And, and I always say, if you're an artist, that's, that's your everything. That's, 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 your, that's your USP. That's your, mm -hmm. that's your one thing that you have that over everything. So I, I was like, I, I need to make sure this album is truth. And a part of my truth right now is the fact that I'm going through this. So we have to address it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking of truth, yes, beautiful. So uh, when I first saw your Brits performance, straight away I said to myself, <laughs> There is no way he did that in rehearsal and it still got put on television. <laughs> I think I even tweeted you that at the time. Like, there is no way all of those people in all of those places in the industry saw that and said, yes, we're still going to televise it. And then I read the book. Yeah. What did it feel like to know you was keeping such a big secret, A? And B, why did you think it was so important for you to address, to use your platform? Really, a lot of people don't understand how the industry works, to risk your yeah, career, yeah, yeah, to yeah. risk your livelihood you know, for other people, for an injustice that you could have just kept silent about. Mm. For, so firstly, keeping the secret was, was so sick. Like, it was, uh, <laughs> it, it, and it's just like, yeah. and do you know the funniest thing? Cause so, um, so who, I think I told Toby and Flips. Um, so the, 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 the day of it, the day before it, I went to the studio with Fraser and Manon, and it was just me, Fraser and Manon, and, I, and, I, and we, made the, we made the beat and I, and I recorded it. And then, then um, when we finally went to rehearsals, I did the rehearsals, but at rehearsals, I was, um, I was spitting a different lyric. I was spitting the 4, 4 p.m. in London lyric. And so you got all the Brits producers and all the bosses and all these, all the executives there and I'm spitting the lyric and they're like, oh, great, Stormzy. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> like, great, great, great. <laughs> so, then, so then I remember, so, in rehearsals, I basically had like a, a trick lyric and I was, I, was, I was throwing it out there and then like hours before we're in the dressing room getting ready and I'm going to flips. I'm like, yo, I've done the mad thing. He's like, yeah. <laughs> he's like, well, he's like tell me the bar. So I was like, bro, I've done the mad thing, bro. Trust me. But going into it, the reason why I was so, the reason, and even, even now, like I still don't even, I didn't even see that as no risk. I didn't see it as nothing. I proper saw it as like, yo, I've got five minutes, cool, like, I need to do this. Like, I, I proper, and the reason why I say I need to do this, I, it, it, it's not even on a hero one. It's not like, oh, like I, I need to, but it was more like, uh, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a brother from um, Labrook Grove, a guy called Riz, Reese, who's, 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 who's actually, oh, do you not know Riz, Reese, all right, my guy. So. Reese, basically, long story short, me and Riz had a conversation on, on, on Instagram via Instagram DMs. He was, he was unhappy about something regarding like me and Grenfell, like something happened. And, and I, was, I was upset that he was choosing to single out me as if like, he was he, like, I was thinking, yo, like I'm, 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 I'm a man of my word. Like I'm very true in what I do. Like you, like, you don't know what I've done for, for the Grenfell situation. Like you can't really, and then he's saying like, nah, bun that. And like, we're having this little aggy conversation. And, and then I said, yo, like let's link up. And then we linked up and he was like, yo, like I, 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 I want to take you to the families, to, to, to Grenfell, to, to the situation they're in now. And then I went there with Riz and, it proper dawned on me at that, that point where I was like, yo, like, I, not that I, and I, 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 I'm, I always put these disclaimers of like, I'm not trying to be no hero or nothing, but I was like, yo, like man's, surely man can do something with whatever platform man's got to, to ensure something happens. Because what, what I learned early on in my career, and I learned this from, you remember when all the district stuff happened with when district yeah, didn't yeah. let the, the young black girls in? And I, and I learned from there, I was like, okay, cool. Like when injustices happen that are very close to my heart and I want to say something, I probably have enough platform now to make something move. So say if, say if I go to a restaurant and there's a, a, a we, we experience some racism from the, the waiter or something. I know I can go on Instagram or my Twitter and, and cause enough stir to cause a problem there. Do you know what I mean? So, so I said, yo, like, 
I might as well do that in, 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 in the biggest way I can where people have been let down by this country and I can literally, with two lyrics, uh, that's all it is, it's two lyrics. Uh, uh, yo, Theresa May, where's that money for Grenfell? What you thought we just forgot about Grenfell? Mm -hmm. Two lyrics out of a whole five minute performance to possibly... There was a bit more than that. Yeah, yeah, there was, more, there was some more, there was some more, there was some more. <laughs> there was a bit, there was a couple I, I remember more, there was a couple the verse. More. Yeah, there was a couple more, but, um, go on, carry but on. I was thinking, if I can yeah. do a little thing like that to... Um, to that that maybe helps helps people in 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 some way shape or form. That's the least I can do, and and it's so mad. And I'm gonna keep saying it because I, I I don't know why I keep saying it, but I always feel need to you know like saying I'm not like it's not it's not a hero thing. But gen, do you know how I see it? And this is gonna be a stupid analogy. Don't even quote me on this. But you, cool. You see if man, this is how I always put it. It's so dumb. This is probably a South London man. But you see if. I, you see, if I go shop here, yeah? you're my bridge in the car, I go shop and mm -hmm. you say, yo, Storms, could you get man a water? That is so minor that, I, do I really deserve a, yo, thank you, my bro, the water, man. <laughs> oh, bro, this, this water you got, oh, my brother, like, it's like, no, not really, like, man, just do that because man's supposed to, you're my bridge and man get you a water. That's genuinely on my mom's, on my mother's life, that's genuinely how I, whether it's grateful, whether it's, uh, the uh, Cambridge Scholarship, whatever it is, I swear to God, I genuinely just feel like, raw man, sh man should, man's on this platform. But, but you do understand that many people, maybe even most people, particularly with platform with things to lose, don't think that way. Yeah, 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 yeah. I do understand that. And, 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 and what I'm probably coming to realise now more than ever is that because I know I'm standing in because I know I'm standing in truth and I'm standing with God and I'm standing in my own, like, my own character, it's like, whatever, like, whatever, like. Mm -hmm. I, and and the, the way I see it, it's like, how can, how can, like, how can man lose on, off that accord if, you, if you're doing something right? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, don't, I, I don't understand. <laughs> it, and it, it can sound, it can sound mad, mm -hmm. like, but it's, it's like, it's like cool. If say if someone say if someone said, "Ah, oh, you play play, uh, we we got this role for you in in a film. Can you play this actor?" And that actor's something you really don't believe in. It's very easy to say no. Do you know what I mean? It's very easy because that's your truth. It's very easy. Same way, it's very easy to do things in your truth actively. So I've never seen it. I've never. I've always just seen it as surely that's what you should do if you have the platform if you and so even down to like someone someone who I've seen recently you know like um Diddy um with you know like he he opens up a, like schools and and I always feel like I, I love Diddy I think that's incredible but you're a billionaire of 100% 100 of course you a school do you, but do, 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 you under, do you know what I mean? No, As in the, the gratitude of, and, and this is probably like, on a deeper one, this is probably like, on a, like, when it comes to the world, I just always feel like, bruv, if you can do a little thing, and I, to be fair, do you know, I, 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 I give that to my sister as well, Rachel. I probably learned that from Rachel where, you know, like, if you can do a little thing for someone, don't, you're a bad man if you don't do it, bruv. I, no, 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 that's how I say, you're a bad man, you're a bad man, like, as in that, like, you've got all that platform. And, and, and man will always use the platform for very self-serving things. And yeah, of course, you're, I'm a man, like, of course, yeah, cool, I'm gonna use my platform so I can get a free trainer or a free meal. Yeah, of course, but I'm, if, yeah, I still want a free meal, yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about, I still want a free meal, trust me. Um, but if I can use my platform for things like that, it's like, and I always say these things, in the grand scale of things, it's, it's a minor, you, sh you should do it, man, like, just, just because whatever whatever little thing you can do, you should do it. I genuinely see it as like getting your bread and a bottle of water from the shop. And I always feel like a lot of the time because you see in this like kind of landscape of, of, of British culture and I, I, I know a lot of the time I am the black British representative. And often a lot of the time I'm very aware I'm the token black British representative as in, okay, whatever's going on in the world of like media and celebrity, like Stormzy's probably the black guy mm -hmm. to do it. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Or like, the, yeah, I'm, I'm aware, like it's, 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 not, it's not a secret, do you know what I mean? So with that, I understand that man has to, like you, man has to because 
Yeah, man, I do, bruv. No, I man, to... honestly, it's sometimes, so... sometimes it's so, it's so difficult to explain, yeah, man, man. But you, you have to, man. You have to. I, there are so many millions of things I wanted to ask you. Unfortunately, this is going to be our last question because we are running out of time. We're already well over. Sorry, guys. No, nah, listen, it's not your fault. It just is what it is. It was, it was a short discussion. So it's a two-part question. You already touched on it a little bit, and you've sort of touched on it in that question there, but I just wanted to highlight it once more. Uh, the Stormzy Scholarship, you know, how did that come about? Why did you want to do it? And then my last question, the future of Murky. Um, the Stormzy Scholarship, that... Um, I think that was, that was more just like a... I've always said, I've understood the spectrum of, you know, sometimes when people, people are um, doing positive things, I think some, a lot of the time things are focused on like, I, I'll put it in, in, in simpler terms, you know, like in school, like the, ba the, bad, the bad, badly behaved kids always have, it's always like, oh, the kid, like we got to give time to the badly behaved kids. And I always say, there's another side of that spectrum where there's geniuses and incredible minds and all of these things. And, and no spectrum, no, of course, nothing's more important than the other, of course. But I was just like, yo, like, that's, that's something I take personal yeah. pride and joy in. As in, like, that's, my, that's probably like my personal own, like, kind of, ah, oh, yeah, like, this is sick, where I like, I, 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 I always, I'm always um, very, inspired by that genius and like incredible minds and people people who are smarter than me and all that I'm like rah this is so like your brain's just incredible so I've always I've always loved that side of, of life forget before I was stormsy or anything I've always just loved that I've always loved the idea of excellence so now that I'm in this position I was like yo that would be so sick if we could do something on that side and 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 yeah, and, and we've done it. And it, that, that's, a, that's another thing where I said, yo, AK, what can, can like, should, we, should, we should have scholarships, like, we should have scholarships, like, before we start going into the, the bigger things of, like, hopefully getting into proper education and inst institutions, like, I was like, yeah, we should, we, like, could we do a scholarship in any way, shape, or form? And so that's how it came about, yeah. Beautiful. And the very last question, what's next? Boy, I, I ain't got a clue. I have no idea. I, I have no. You're working idea. on new music, right? Oh, oh, oh! Music wise. What's next for Murky? Not in the universe. Music wise. What's next for you? What's next for Murky? What's the what's, so, what's the plan? Murky with Murky, I feel like I always say, I always say, I want Murky to be this engine, this hub, this this thing that's larger than anything. It's larger than myself. It's larger than an idea. It's like a kind of whole ethos. It's a it's not even a brand because I think a brand is very self-serving where it's like, yeah, the brand, we want it. But it's like, no, I want this to be a thing that just exists in the world and has so many branches of it. It's an umbrella for healthcare, education, music, ar architecture, like anything, like anything that can move. I don't, do you know what? I'm not even going to say anything that can move things forward because I think that's a very people say move things forward and for the culture and all of these buzzwords, but it's like, I just want this to be a beautiful thing that mm -hmm. does Perfect. beautiful stuff and has beautiful stories. And a lot of the time, I don't know how that's gonna come about, but I just know that as long as we keep throwing ideas out there, as long as, I, as myself and the team like stay together and stay connected and we keep the same spirit, because anytime we do things, the, the spirit of it, that's, that's, that's what I love about my team the most. There's, there's never any ill spirit. It's never like, oh, we're doing this because of that. It's always just for that sole purpose. And, and, that's a, and the reason why I always credit my team for that is because in this industry of creativeness and music, it's, it's, it's often the total opposite. There's always a purpose that isn't for the greater good or it isn't deeper on a spiritual one. And I swear to God, that's one, you, you, to, to get a phone call from AK and she's telling me, yeah, we're not gonna, um, we're not gonna reveal the identity of the two kids that, that got the scholarship because they're gonna go to uni and people are gonna be in their face and they won't be able to study. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I didn't even think of that, but I was like, yes, of course, of course, that's what, of course we don't re reveal them. Like, what we, of course we don't, but I was like, that just shows the ethos, you know what I mean? That shows 100%. the spirit we're doing it in. And I was like, that's a beautiful thing, but yeah. So in terms of murky, just always, we're gonna be always be doing hopefully more incredible things like this and keeping it pushing. And on the other side, on, on, on the Stormzy side of things, on the, on the music side, I'm, I'm, I'm coming, we're ready. <laughs> 
You ready, you ready. It's been a long time coming. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure coming. you pick up your copy of the book. Please make some noise for Big Mike, a.k.a. Stormzy. Ladies and gentlemen, big up.